In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, I'm going to do a little uh, video here, hopefully not too long, just uh, a study on the Day of the Lord and the Perusia. Uh, I believe there are two different things, and I'll kind of get into that as we go here. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank you guys for all your comments. Um, for those of you that have purchased the book, um, the Beyond the Second Veil went global distribution today. Uh, unfortunately, for whatever reason, the only thing I could find it on was eBay, and they literally doubled the price. So they're kind of a middleman that's making a lot of money <laughs> off of uh, off of the publisher. So uh, probably the Lulu website is the easiest way to go, and I'll leave a link to that uh, in the description of this video here. <clears throat> but I want to do a little bit of a study here on the Day of the Lord, and um, hopefully come to um, a little deeper understanding. Okay, I, I I'm going to throw out some questions there. So I'm going to I'm going to start with second a letter from Second Peter, and I'm going to move into the seals a little bit. And um, again, this isn't a proclamation of scripture. I can throw out some questions that kind of, like I say, pique the interest and that kind of thing, and maybe um, tie things together a little bit as well. Um, one of the things that we have to remember when studying, uh, well, any scripture, a, a really good rule to do is to catch certain phrases or very important phrases within whatever you're studying and then harmonize that with throughout the other scriptures okay and usually when you do that you can come with you can come away with a pretty solid foundation of um of what you're what you're studying and what you're looking at you can come away with a, a deeper understanding a lot of the time okay the other thing i want to talk about is uh that i'm going to bring up here is that is the spiritual sense of not only reading but writing Okay, um, one of the things that we have to understand, especially in apocalyptic literature and parables of Jesus, uh, it is contained in the Old Testament in the law and things like that, but it's not as pronounced uh, as it is in the New Testament in the in the letters, um, the Catholic letters, the um, the parables of Jesus, and especially in the Book of Revelation, because the Book of Revelation is written with so much symbolism, but a lot of that symbolism can be understood by understanding the Jewish feasts and the Jewish culture and the Jewish traditions. Um, as a matter of fact, I would even go as far as to say that um, much of the salvific plan, the mysteries of it, can be understood if we understand the Jewish feasts and the harvest times and things like that, the, the jubilee and the, the counting of, of days and all that kind of stuff. It all plays a role. But to understand and to remember that the Bible is a is a Jewish Christian scriptures. Okay, so the apostles when they wrote it were Jewish, and they incorporated a lot of their Jewish traditions in there, and as well as Jesus in the way that they spoke and in the way that they wrote. Okay, um, and so we, when we when we understand their background and uh, how it the law itself and the regulations and the harvest and when all those things were supposed to happen throughout a year, how they've been transformed into a physical thing that God gave uh, for them to do, how it's kind of flipped over into the spiritual sense, okay? Because ultimately what we're talking about is the economy of salvation and the harvest of souls, okay? And so it, it kind of expands that way. Really the law is like a... Um, like a kindergarten book in uh, algebra, let's say, or math, okay? And then you get to um, you get to uh, eighth grade or whatever it is, and then you understand why all those little basic things were so important to learn in the beginning, okay? Um, so I'm going to just read this real quickly because I don't want to take too long in this video. I've got, I've got some things that I need to get done, um, but I don't want to, you know, not not post anything and keep everybody uh, waiting in that. So, what I want to do here basically is take Second um, Peter chapter three, where he speaks about the Perusia, and I want to show how it overlaps um, the sixth seal. And then when I go into the sixth seal, I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to go into the first and I think the second and third, uh, just to kind of give a little bit of. Uh, an overview to things. Um, one of the things to understand about the seals is they're really an overview to the whole book. And just because they are in order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, does not necessarily mean that they are opened in order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Um, very, very important to remember. A lot of times there's a lot of bouncing around. Jesus does this in his teaching in the gospel where he'll bounce around. 
okay? So I'm going to start with um, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, okay? Um, he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved in fire, and the earth and everything done on it will be found out. All right, so, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Let me break this down for you because he's talking about a number of different things. Remember the heading of this is the denial of the perusia, okay? And then he's gonna go on, as a matter of fact, I would say this, Peter bounces around here a little bit as well, okay? So they'll they'll bring in an idea, they'll go to the end of, of what that idea is, and then they will insert something later on that actually goes in the middle between one and two, kind of like that, okay? He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, Okay, so what do we have there? First thing we have is the day of the Lord and like a thief. So like a thief is one of these phrases that I tell you um, that I've said that if you grab a hold of and then you harmonize throughout the scriptures, you can come away with some deeper understanding or better understanding of what the scriptures are trying to convey. Okay, Jesus spoke of this um, day like a thief um, where he said one taken, one left. He spoke of this day of the Lord like a thief when he said, no one knows the day or the hour, okay? Which calls into question, and I've heard, um, what is it? Uh, interpretations of this being the rapture, which we already know the pre-tribulation rapture is a false teaching and it teaches the exact opposite of what scripture teaches. And I've also heard it as a reference to um, the illumination of conscience, which is also false because Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. And when you study Garabandal, Mary, Mary Lowly knew the year, if not the day of the warning. So that's impossible. Um, just got to, you know, pick up on those things. Um, so like a thief that appears in the gospel where I just said, it also appears in the book of Revelation. I think chapter, I think it's 13. Anyway, it's where the um, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet spew out spirits out of their mouth to gather the nations for the battle of Armageddon, and then the the sequence of events there that um, that John is describing is um, interrupted by Jesus Himself when it says, "Behold, I am coming like a thief." So there's something that tells us is that as the armies are gathering for the battle of Armageddon, the day of the Lord has not yet happened. And that's, I've said in the past, one of the main signs to watch for is the Battle of Armageddon. The problem with that is, um, depending on the, on the, uh, on the uh, level of chastisement, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'd be able to see that on TV or on the internet or on things, that, because those things may be broken down. So again, no one knows the day or the hour. The only, you know, so it very, what I'm saying is very well could be the only way you would ever see the armies gathering for the Battle of Armageddon is actually be on a mountain that overlooks Megiddo, okay, physically. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and then he goes on. He says, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar and the elements will be dissolved by fire and the earth and everything done on it will be found out, Okay. So again, we have a number of different events here. We have the day of the Lord coming like the thief. Notice he says, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar. Okay, so that's another event that happens after the day of the Lord. Jesus said this himself immediately after the tribulation of those days. Um, the sun and moon would be darkened or whatever and then um the heavens would be shaken and then they will see the son of man okay so there's different events there's a step to, there's steps to it okay um I, I break a lot of this down in the book this uh beyond the second veil in that way um the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar and the elements will be dissolved by fire okay so we have the elements dissolved by fire happening very close to, if not simultaneously, with the heavens um, passing away with a mighty roar, okay? And this actually falls in uh, in context with, with the gospel account, as well as um, the prophetic books, okay, where the phrase heaven shaken is. Remember in Hebrews, and I think it's chapter 12 or 13, he says the heavens will be shaken and that is a sign and points to the removal of created things. He didn't say it was the removal of created things, but it's a sign that points to, okay? So that points to 
could very well be the thief day of the Son of Man in which everything is purified in fire, or it could be the removal of created things at the end of time when everything at, at the consummation, the great white throne judgment, or it can be both, okay? Remember, um, prophecy has a rolling effect, and it's one of the th reasons that things can't be locked down in stone. Okay, so moving on. Then he bounces back, okay? He says, since everything is to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you be? Conducting yourselves in holiness and devotion, waiting and hastening for the coming day of God. This is one of the reasons we're not to fear it. Listen to the way he, he says, waiting and hastening. In other words, calling it down. We do this every time we say, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, we, it, We're prophesying. We're, we're calling upon the kingdom to come down. Okay, Maybe not the way we should now, but we will. <laughs> we'll, we'll be put in position to where we have no choice but to pray correctly. Okay, um, because of which the heavens will be dissolved in flames and the elements melted by fire. That, that's a, a very, very high uh, temperature of heat. Now listen, but according to his promise, we await a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. In the book, uh, Beyond the Second Veil, I think this is one of the verses that I used in support of a period of peace. Okay, because at the con consummation, the great white throne judgment, everything is consumed, even hell. All of hell gives up its dead. All of the sea, the earth, everything gives up its dead. And then there is the, the final judgment, right? He says, therefore, beloved, since you await these things to be, uh, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him and at peace. Okay, so again, we're not to fear these things. We're supposed to look forward to them, okay? will be elevated in grace as these things happen. So what I want to do here, first of all, before I go into the earlier seals, is I want to specifically look at how this day of the Lord, okay, or the day of divine wrath, it's the same thing because he talks about it being purified in fire. That's the purification of fire. That's the initial purification that leads to what I believe to be a purity piece as promised at Fatima or the Eucharistic reign of Jesus or the Feast of Tabernacles, however you want to view that. There's a number of different ways to do it, all of them pointing to the exact same thing, which is really a, an inspiration, a confirmation, and an affirmation. Okay, it's kind of how it works. <clears throat> so let's do this. I'm going to bounce back and forth here. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Okay, so we have the thief day of the Son of Man in the gospel accounts. Find that, highlight it, go into the book of Revelation, highlight it. Go into the Catholic letters, highlight it, because that thief day is the exact same day. And knowing Peter, the way he describes this, the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar and the elements will be dissolved in fire. That is a purification in fire. Okay, so the world that was in the ancient world was purified by water. This present world in this present time has been reserved for a purification in fire. Okay, and he speaks about this, I believe, in his first letter. When he says, um, even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested in fire. So your faith, which is much more precious, also must be tested. Okay. Unfortunately, if you're familiar with the prophetic books, there's only one third of the human race that will pass through that. Um, it, and and uh, they'll have the faith to go through that. Okay. Um, so I want to jump. I want to go from... Uh, the second Peter and how the first Pope describes this day of the Lord, this thief day of the Son of Man, obviously being the day of divine wrath, okay? Um, and how it overlaps the sixth seal in the book of Revelation. And again, this is just a study, and I'm not making a proclamation on Scripture. I would, it would say this, you know, for anyone that is studies Scripture or teaches Scripture or studies this kind of prophecy, especially apocalyptic literature, um, one of the things that I would say, and it was the advice that was given to me very, very early on, was to present it in a way as this is how I understand it, or this is what it could be, or this may be a, a way of looking at it, and always present it that way. And what that does is it protects you from proclaiming scripture as if this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. For one, I'm a lay person, so I'm not in a position of authority to do that. The other thing is, is that you're, even if inspired, 
okay, there can be errors or something that's overlooked. And so this is one, this is the main reason that it is the magisterium that has the authority to declare a, an understanding of prophetic scripture. With that being said, remember prophecy has a rolling effect. Okay. But the reason that that is so important is because if I say, well, this is the great white throne judgment. Okay. And I may understand it that way. I may fully see it. Okay. The problem is, is if later on down the road, the church makes a declaration and says, this isn't right. Then do you realize I've distorted scripture and in distorting scripture and proclaiming something that is yet to take place, what that makes me is a false prophet. And that's why it is so important when you study or if you're going to um, present things um, from a, a prophetic standpoint or any scripture for that matter, it's always best to say, this is how I understand it, or this is the understanding I believe I've been given. And that way you're, you're protected from, from that very thing. Okay. So we see this with, um, uh, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture. Okay. This is how the Protestants fall into, into traps. This is exactly some of the mistakes that are made. Okay. So John Darby would have been perfectly fine if he would have said, well, I kind of see it like this. I, I kind of understand it like this. You know, I'm not saying this is it, but I'm saying this is what it could be. He would have been perfectly fine. But the fact that he proclaimed something as a truth and, you know, would have been humble enough to listen to the church and those in authority at the time, he would have never distorted the scripture and he would have never proclaimed a false doctrine. Okay, because the writings were eventually put on Rome's list of prohibited reading, and that was the reason why. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm passing on advice that I was given that I believe is very good advice, and that's to say this is how I understand it or this is how this could be. Now, if you have that understanding or if you have that inspiration, the, um, the job then is to build theology around that, okay, uh, that is, as I say, already solid, and then use the scripture to back up the presentation. And then even then, it has to be handed to those in authority that would look over it. So this is one of the reasons that I put in the book, Beyond the Second Veil. Oh, by the way, it went it went global today. It, so there's a global distribution. I haven't been able to find it on Amazon. I did find it on eBay. <laughs> Unfortunately, they doubled the price for this thing. And so you know, it looks like the, the, the Lulu bookstore is probably going to be the cheapest way to go. Um, they, they take an enormous amount of money for distribution. And then what they're doing is they take that money and then they replace that money and then double that money. So a book that was 18 bucks is now 35 on eBay. Okay. So I'm just saying a lot cheaper on the Lulu thing. Um, I may be able to do, um, uh, bulk orders too. So let me know if you guys want to do that. If anyone wants that, I, I may be able to do that um, at a cheaper rate. So let's go back to this and um, keep in mind what I said. Okay, this I'm just passing on wisdom that was given to me. And this is why I have no fear of presenting things uh, in scripture because I'm always presenting it in a way that I understand it or I believe the understanding has been given. I will never give a final definition of scripture because that, that, well, that job is reserved um, for those in authority within the church. Okay. So really quickly, I'll read through this again, and then I want to jump to the sixth seal. We're going to see how this overlaps and how it, it kind of works. Okay. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar and the elements will be dissolved in fire and the earth and everything done on it will be found out. Okay. Now let's jump to the sixth seal. He says, then I watched as he broke open the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. Okay. Great earthquake appears a number of times throughout the book of Revelation. The other thing I would say about the book of Revelation is that we should never approach it as it's as though none of it's happened. And that is really a Protestant way of approaching the book as well. At the beginning of the book, Jesus tells John to write down what has happened, what is happening and what is yet to come. So John wrote all that down. That includes what has happened. That's past tense. What is happening? What is happening in the time of John and what is yet to come? Okay. So the book of Revelation, when I look at it, um, basically covers um, 
the dawn of creation all the way to the end. And that is the great, that's, you know, the great unveiling of revelation is what it, what it means. And unveiling is really what's being revealed there. What is being unveiled is Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> so just be cautious when you hear people teaching the book of revelation as though none of it's happened. Okay. But I do want to look at these seals because what you're dealing with, with the sixth seal is basically what Peter was talking about, which happens at the end of this epoch. Okay. It's kind of odd because it's at the beginning of the book and not the end of the book. See what I mean? So it's written out of order. It covers a lot more time than most people think. And uh, the seals very well could be opened out of order. Just because they're numbered one, two, three, four, five, six, seven does not mean they're opened in that order. Okay. That's another thing to keep in mind. Okay. So six seal. He says, then as I watched, he broke open the sixth seal and there's a great earthquake. The sun turned black, dark as sackcloth, and the whole moon became like blood. The stars in the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. Okay, here's where I talked a little bit about the spiritual writing um, and uh, how that kind of works. And when you can tell when it's spiritual writing or symbolic writing is just by asking yourself, um, questions, okay, which basically leads to a, um, a, a process of deductive reasoning, okay, so the sun turned black, dark as sackcloth, and the whole moon became like blood, okay, here's the thing that you have to ask yourself, I've heard this said, that this represents the three days of darkness, do you realize if that represents the three days of darkness and the sun is literally turned black, dark as sackcloth, there's absolutely no physical and possible way that the moon could um, show uh, or shine uh, in the color of blood. And the reason is, is because the, sun, the, the, the light from the moon is, is the reflection of the sun. So if the sun is dark as black as sackcloth, there's no light. That way, that means that there's no way that the, the moon could reflect a reddish glow. Okay. So um, look at dark black sackcloth. Look how dark that is. There is there's there is no light to it. Okay. So a symbolic writing. Personally, I think it represents the church. And the reason is, is because the stars in the sky fell to earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. Okay. A strong wind is basically a storm. Um, a, it's also a representation for the Holy Spirit. Remember the whole, the, uh, the, uh, the world is purified in fire. Okay. The unripe figs shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. They're not ready. And you notice it's a very specific tree that they are shaken loose from. Okay. It kind of goes along with, I am the vine, you are the branches, uh, the tree and the mustard seed, the biggest bush, all of that. That's all spiritual writing. Okay, and it should be understood that way. It's a, it, when, when you understand it that way, um, what can happen is, again, it will lead you into a deeper understanding of Scripture. Okay, so it's, we shouldn't just read things on their face as, as it is, because there are deeper meanings. There are layers to Scripture and different uh, senses of reading a Scripture. Okay, but the deeper the senses, the more understanding, the more wisdom you're going to have looking at them. Okay, now listen carefully. Um, then the sky was divided, torn like a scroll curling up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Okay, remember, what we're looking at here is basically the same thing that we read in P in Peter chapter or Second Peter chapter three. We have a series of events. Okay, there's the seal that's opened. There's a great earthquake. The sun is turned black, dark as sackcloth. The stars in the sky fell. I think that we're at number four or five now. Um, then I saw the sky was divided and torn up like a scroll. Okay, listen to Peter. Then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar and, and the world will be dissolved by fire. Okay, Hebrews talks about uh, the heavens being shaken only once. And this is a sign and points to the removal of created things so that what is unshaken may remain. So there's a remaining after this. All right. But then again, what we're doing is I'm highlighting this phrase. And it appears in a number of different ways. Heaven shaken, um, the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, the sky being rolled up like a scroll. It's basically all the same thing, okay? Just paraphrased. He said, the kings of the earth and nobles and the military officers, the rich, the powerful, and the slave and the free person hid themselves 
in caves and among mountain crags. They cried out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? This is the world being purified in fire. This is the day of divine wrath. It's so funny the way it works. Uh, you know, um, Our Lady, the Blessed Mother used the, the, that exact phrase when speaking to Faustina of Jesus coming as the just judge. Okay, so again, I've heard a number of different um, interpretations of this. Um, one of them being that uh, this is all the bad people because all the good people are raptured away. Um, I've heard it referred to as the event of the warning is prophesied at Garabindal, um, which I don't understand how that could be because it says very clearly, and the, wrath, the day of wrath is here. It's happening, okay? These, these things that happened before this are preludes to it, okay? Um, so the heavens shaken, or the, the sky being rolled up like a scroll, um, or uh, the, uh, how did Peter put it? Um, the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, okay? Is, is, it consi is consistent throughout the Old Testament books and the prophets when you see the heavens shaken, the heavens shaken, and then the day of divine wrath, the heaven shaken, then the day of divine wrath, okay? And so the day of divine wrath is here in this sixth seal. Um, again, what you see in the, uh, the stars in the, in the sky that fell to earth like unripe figs shaken loose from the tree in a strong wind. Um, again, that's spiritual writing it, because it's, it's absolutely physically scientifically impossible for the moon to give off a reddish hue if the sun is black, if there's no light coming off the sun. And I've heard I've heard an interpretation of this is the three days of darkness. But when you look at that prophecy, which I recently have, it says that it'll be so dark that you can't even see your hand in front of your face. So if you can't see your hand in front of your face, how in the world is the moon going to reflect a reddish glow off the sun, which gives no light? Do you see what I mean? So through deductive reasoning. And so all you have to do, again, the key is listening and really reading and studying and, and making notes, take notes, you know, um, and pray, pray when you read the scriptures, read them prayerfully, okay? Um, so I'm gonna back up to this sixth seal or the second seal here and um, kind of look at that and uh, in a different way than it's been looked at. Remember I'd said that the seals don't necessarily have to be open in order, or they could actually be opened in um, reverse even, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be opened one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just because that's the way they're written in the book of Revelation or recorded in the book of Revelation. There are pieces of the book of Revelation that are written out of order. I may, I may even give you an example uh, in another video real quick because it's not that hard if you look at it. One, one, it deals with the beast rising from the abyss, but it's written out of order and it's written out of order for a reason. I think it's been written out of order for a reason so that the only ones that would ever understand it was, you know, are being given more understanding of it would have to be a grace coming from God. That, that's what I believe. So it, it kind of like the book of Daniel, the way it's been sealed right? Until the end time, the angel tells him, seal it up until the end time. Okay. So he says, uh, this is the second seal. When he broke open the second seal, I heard the second living creature cry out, come forward. Another horse came out, a red one. Its rider was given power to take peace away from the earth so that people would slaughter one another. And it was given a huge sword. People have been slaughtering each other since Cain and Abel. Okay. The world has never, ever been in a in a, a period of peace in the way that Jesus and Our Lady speak of peace. Um, remember Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not in the way the world gives it do I give it, but it's the way he gives it. In other words, it is a divine peace. It is the person of the Holy Spirit, um, a, a divine peace, a heavenly peace, okay? At Fatima, we were promised a period of peace. And then in Divine Mercy, he says, the world will not have that peace until it turns with trust to my mercy. Okay, but peace has already been prophesied. So this whole thing of peace, I don't believe we've experienced 
okay, in the in the way that heaven is speaking of it. But you'll notice this. Its writer was given power to take away peace from the earth. And it made me wonder in looking at this, because I, that's what I do. I kind of look at everything from a different angle. Do you know if you if you start the, the seals kind of from the back so that it begins with six and then bounces to like one and then, you know, seven and then three and because they can very easily. But do you realize if peace is taken away from the earth in the way that heaven talks about, that seal would actually fit after the period of peace because that's what the world is given. So it could very well be a reference to a period after the period of peace or during the end of the period of peace when when all hell breaks loose again, okay? Now, I'm not saying that it is, but I'm saying it very well could be. I mean, why not, right? So that people would slaughter one another and um, he was given a huge sword. Now, again, we can go all the way back to Cain and Abel and that's where it started. You go through the entire Old Testament and peace was taken away from the earth with when, well, with the, the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay, basically, <laughs> death entered the world, but it started with Cain and Abel, and from that, from then on, from that time on to up till now, we've had nothing but wars, you know, over and over, and even if they're not big wars, we've had little ones, and so people have been killing each other since the beginning of time, and so to look at this and think that this hasn't happened, remember what Jesus said, write down what has happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen, okay, so let's move forward. I want to move into this um, this third seal real quick because there are some things that I found interesting about it. He says, when he broke open the third seal, I heard the third living creature cry out, come forward. I looked and there was a black horse and its rider held a scale in his hand. Okay, this is the scales of justice. I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. Um, it said, and this is different because... In the third seal, you have a voice in the midst of the four living creatures. In the other seals, you just hear a voice cry out. That's that's kind of a different thing, okay? But what he says here, um, I heard what seemed to be a voice in the in the midst of the four living creatures. A ration of wheat costs a day's pay, and three rations of barley costs a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil or the wine. Now, this is fascinating to me, and I just, um, this kind of... Uh, train of thought has kind of, uh, how do I say, sprung to a, another level this morning when I was reading this. Um, but do you realize if if we take this literally, because one of the ways this has been looked at is an economic collapse, and it's not it, not only today, but you know, in the past, it's been looked at like that. I think even in your footnotes, it says something like that. But do you realize if it rec if it if it represents an economic collapse? then it is warning us of something that Jesus himself told us not to worry about. Jesus told us not to worry what we are to eat. He told us that we're not to worry what we are to wear. He's told us not to worry about tomorrow. He told the apostles, don't take a walking stick, don't take a second tunic, and don't take a bag of money. A ration of wheat costs a day's pay and three rations of barley costs a day's pay. But do not damage the olive oil or the wine. So when we move into... The um, I would say the spiritual sense of reading or the symbolic sense of writing, okay, from a Jewish perspective, this seal makes perfect sense. And it also gives us a an idea of the time frame of where it's opened, okay, not as in a date, but in events, okay, as in signs to watch for. So just think about that. Ask yourself the question. Remember, I talked about deductive reasoning. Why would God warn us that things are going to get more expensive when Jesus himself told us not to worry what we already eat? You see, it doesn't make any sense. It makes absolutely no sense when you look at it that way in light of the words of Jesus. Okay, But if we look at it in terms of the economy of salvation and we look at it in terms of uh, harvests of souls, it makes perfect sense, okay? A ration of wheat costs the day's pay and three rations of barley costs the day's pay. The wheat and the barley were harvested towards the end of summer during the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement is the Day of the Lord, according to Christian theology, which I make this connection in the book Beyond the Second Veil, which has now been fulfilled in the church in the Feast of Divine Mercy and was put in place for the specific sin of the apostasy, which is one of the signs that Jesus said to watch for. Okay, as well as St. Paul. 
um, but do not damage the olive oil or the wine. And that when so when this is looked at, and I've heard different um, different commentators um, look at this and, and interpret it as an economic collapse. The one thing that's never looked at or never followed up, I never hear that last verse, but do not damage the olive oil or the wine. Why? The, when, you, when you look at it from a salvific perspective, when you look at it from a harvest perspective, when you look at it in terms of um, the economy of salvation and the way the harvest works, um, you come away with, a, a like I say, a different interpretation and quite possibly a deeper understanding of what the seal actually represents. The reason that the, the olive oil and the wine were, are not damaged, okay, how I understand it anyway, is because it was needed later in the year, okay? So the grapes and the, um, the olive oil was harvested, but it was purified. It was made into something better because the grapes and the, and the olive oil was needed um, specifically in uh, Satuk, I think, I think is the name of the feast. I'd have to look it up again. Um, but the wheat and the, and, the, uh, and the barley was harvested first, okay? And then so then the, the grapes and the olives, and then they're purified and they're harvested later in the year. They're used, they're needed later in the year, okay? So that's how you can see that the Jewish feasts, when you incorporate it specifically into this seal, how it works in the economy of salvation, not only that, but also how it works in, uh, in, the, uh, in the order or of harvest because the harvest of souls happens in stages. All right. We could say that um, the great flood of Noah was a harvest. OK, and so then you you end that epoch with the coming of Jesus. And this has been over this entire period of time has been a harvest. OK, and you get to a point to where, you know, as it says in the book of Revelation, the angel swings his sickle over the earth and the whole thing is harvested. OK, one of the things that you'll notice that's harvested in that is the grapes. What are grapes? Grapes is is uh, wine. It's that's what it's purified into. Okay, and notice the the uh, the difference between what's done here. Okay, and also uh, let me point this out first. In the third seal, specifically, what we're talking about is the scales of justice. Okay, and damage. We're not talking about what it, what it costs. We're talking about damage. So when it says a ration of wheat costs a day's pay and three rations of barley costs a day's pay, what we're talking about is damage to the wheat and to the barley. And that's why that will go on. But do not damage the olive oil or the wine. Okay, so the wine and the olive oil are not damaged. And the reason is because they were needed later in the year. Now back up from the whole thing and think of it in terms of uh, the redemptive plan of God, right? The salvific plan of God from beginning to end, from creation, from the fall until the very end. And think of it in terms of a year. That whole span of time, one year, okay? Do you realize that that would absolutely work perfectly with the grapes and the olive oil and the wine being needed, okay, towards the end of summer that moves into the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, which comes after. It's the feast directly after the Day of Atonement, which again, according to Christian theology, is the Day of the Lord. And when the barley and the wheat would have been used is during the, the Day of Atonement. It would have been used during that time, okay? Um, fast, the only fast they knew. So anyway, I, I don't want this to run on too long, but I did want to do a little bit of a study here with you guys on the seals and the Day of the Lord. And just a different way of looking at things. Um, like I say, if you take the uh, the words like a thief and you harmonize them in context throughout the scriptures when that is spoken and what that means, it is speaking specifically of the day of the Lord, the day of divine wrath. And over and over and over again, the scriptures themselves attest to that. And one of the main ones, like I say, is I believe it's Revelation. I can look at it up real quick. Um, I think it's 13. I know it's not 12 for sure. Um, Maybe it is 19. It 
it is um, 16. Chapter 16, verse 15. Okay. And this is why I was talking about the Battle of Armageddon actually being one of the main signs to watch for. If we can actually see it, we should always be ready. He says, they, um, they went out to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So the great day of God Almighty would actually another be another phrase or another paraphrase of the day of the Lord or the day of divine wrath. Okay, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who watches and keeps his clothes ready so that he may, got, may not go naked and people see him exposed. That right there is a paraphrase and falls in line with what we just read from second peter when he says everything will be found out remember in other words exposed um so <clears throat> anyway just a different way of looking at the seals in the book of revelation and kind of how the teaching of the first pope about the day of the lord and the day of uh the son of man um the thief day or the day of divine wrath if you will um how that overlays uh the entire sixth seal of the book of Revelation. And you what you see in the in the first three is really a build up to that. You know, um, I think the first one is the white horse. Um, there's two other places, I believe, in the book of Revelation where that white horse appears. One of them is when Jesus comes with the armies of heaven behind him and the sword coming out of his mouth and destroys these armies uh, gathered in Megiddo to siege Jerusalem. Um, and the, the other white horse appears at the very bottom of that chapter. But if you read it carefully, what you'll note is that that white horse at the bottom of the chapter is a completely different white horse than the one that's coming out of the sky and that Jesus is riding. It's a man. And it's very, you can see that very clearly. Okay, so it's one of the ways heaven mirrors earth. So you have a um, what would seem to be a leader or an anointed king um, protecting Jerusalem. Uh, from these uh, from these armies. And then, you know, obviously it's like a David and Goliath scenario, but in the end, God wins the victory and destroys them. And so um, one of the things to know, look for, okay, because there are a number of different days or events of God. Jesus makes that clear in the Gospel of Luke when he tells the apostles, you would long to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Um, that is plural. And the days of uh, days of the Son of Man uh, being plural are events of God throughout uh, the history of the world and throughout the salvific plan of God. So anyway, you get an idea of what I'm talking about with spiritual writing and maybe a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about with the Jewish feasts and the harvest. And one of the reasons, it's really one of the reasons I spent so much time um, in the book Beyond the Second Veil, I spent so much time talking about the, um, the, uh, the consistency of um, divine mercy and how it corresponds to the Day of Atonement feast according to Jewish law. If if things go the way they are normally going or the way they seem to be pointing, okay, the next feast coming up is the Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Tabernacles itself pointing to a period of peace, okay, where we become a, a living, living hosts. And um, so, like I said, I talked a little bit about this um, in the book when I went into the book of Daniel and also uh, in the gospel accounts. So um, if you haven't had a chance, check out the book. I'll leave a, a link to it here. I am still, like I said, I'm trying to find it on Amazon. It just went this morning. I, it got approved. Um, but the, the only, the first place I found it was eBay and it was like $35 and I couldn't believe it because I'm only charging 18 for it. So um Anyway, if you find it out there, let me know. I do appreciate the comments on the writing part of it. Um, I think that was from one of our viewers, uh, Colleen. Um, that was really a, a confirmation for me. So um, I am writing. I'm doing some writing right now on the book of Daniel. Like I say, I, I, I am going to run everything uh, by a spiritual director before I make any of that public. That's just, again, out of obedience uh, um, to authority you know there's certain things that that you know i may understand that it's just for them i guess and so uh i don't really know what to do with it so um you know i'm sharing what i can and um trying to learn in the process too you know like i say we're all human we're all in a process of learning um but 
the the way to uh, to approach scripture. Um, there's nothing wrong with interpreting scripture in a different way. Again, um, the most important thing is that you're not making a declaration of of what that is uh, in a in a way that it that it sounds like you know, uh, like you're making a declaration of what it is. The important thing is to say, this is how I understand it, or this is what this could be. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll look at scripture and I'll understand something a certain way, and it's backed up by something that I believe the Lord revealed to me. But again, there's, you know, through prayer or whatever, through a grace. But again, that's a whole process of discernment. And then you have to also understand that there's the human element and, and so, you know, you always want to present those things to those in authority. But anytime you're dealing with the scripture, you want to say, this is how I understand it, or this is the way I could see it, or the way it could be seen, or something like that. And, um, and always be open, you know, to, to other ideas and things like that. Because if you get locked in one train of thought, then you're, then you're right there with the Protestants. And you're making a declaration of scripture, and this is what this is, and this is what this is. And... Um, and you you could very well be deceived in, into um, you know proclaiming something that is uh, prophetic that is yet to take place, but in a sense distorts scripture. And that's why I was given um, you know the I believe the wise advice um, you know to any time that I teach or I get into things like this is to say this is how I understand it or this is the way it could be seen. And so personally, I believe there are. A number of different views that come together. There's not one or right or wrong. I believe they all come together, inevitably leading to a greater truth. I don't. I don't believe there's one person that gets all of it. You know, um, I think that uh, it's a collaborative effort, and I think God does that on purpose in order to keep us humble. So, anyway, um, thanks again for the prayers and for the comments on the book. I'll leave the link to uh, to that one. Uh, as well as the Concerning Chloe in the description of this video. Hit the thumbs up and the subscribe if you like what you're seeing and like what you hear, what you're learning, if you're learning anything. If you have any suggestions, feel free to leave those comments too, okay? So may God bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you, and may he grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.